If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. So look, for the first 24 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. We talk a little bit about fitness. Uh, we start out by talking about the pluses and minuses of technology and tracking. So you get a lot of new devices that are out there that will track your sleep, track your steps. It's ruining Doug's sleep. Track your food. It has. Um, a lot of benefit to them, but can they also uh, reduce your quality of life and maybe even reduce your progress? Good part of that episode. Then we talked about performance versus health in athletics and an exercise known as the Jefferson Curl. Adam got in a little tiff with somebody on Instagram again. <laughs> it wasn't really a tiff. No, nah, it was more uh, of a. It was a, what's 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 below uh, a tiff? Like a yeah. like a friendly nudge, scuffle, like a like uh, a nudge. Yeah, a, yeah, a, a, friendly, <laughs> a friendly nudge. He had a friendly yeah. nudge, so we talked about that. A little pokey poke. Then we talked about quarter squats and plyometrics, and then we got into the bulk of the episode where we talked about the most underutilized yet probably one of the most effective variables that you can mess with to get your body to respond again in terms of building muscle and burning body fat and improving your performance, rest periods. Yes, they're that important. So we talk all about rest periods in this episode. I'd also like to remind everybody that this month, our flagship foundational fitness program, MAPS Anabolic, is 50% off. All you got to do is go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code RED50, R-E-D-5-0, no space, and get half off. That program is excellent for speeding up your metabolism, building muscle, um, and sculpting your body and getting stronger. It's got stronger. a brand new look, Sal. That's right. Uh, new version is going to be coming out, but if you have it now or you get it now with the 50% off, you'll be updated automatically. By the way, at mapsfitnessproducts.com, we have other MAPS fitness programs, many of them suited for different people and different goals. Go see which one works best for you. Hey, uh, I hear your uh, sleep's getting a little bit better nowadays, huh? Yeah, I've taken away the competitive aspect of it. <laughs> <laughs> competitive sleep. It's, this uh, is so anyway, the, these, uh, there's a app that you can use for your sleep that gives you a sleep score. Yeah, yeah. And so I was using it, yeah. and I was trying to improve my sleep because it's something I don't you know, do well. I don't get to bed early enough and that type of thing. Uh, typically, though, I've been able to sleep all night long and not have a, an issue. But then I started using this app, trying to you know become more aware of my sleep, yeah. get to bed earlier, and it was helping with that. It was helping me get to bed earlier. However, I was waking up all the time. I couldn't figure that out. Oh. That's not like me. And then I realized after doing it for about two weeks and getting horrible sleep that I was competing. <laughs> <laughs> I was competing to get a good score, right? You know, it's funny, though. I could see. <laughs> totally true. Yeah, yeah, no, I could see how that would happen. I mean, think about how many times have you guys had a night where you're restless and you can't sleep and all you're thinking about is trying to sleep. Of course. Yeah. You know, and then it just makes it worse. Or, or you go to, like, you know you have to wake up. At a particular time to be somewhere. Mm -hmm. So like, I got to wake up. I'll make sure I set my alarm. Right. And then you end up waking up every hour, checking your alarm. Be like, okay, I got three more hours. Oh, I got two more hours. It's, it, it just goes to show you the how powerful your mental, mental state is. And all these devices and tools that we use are only good are only good if they're used properly. If they, if they start making you so hyper aware and focused on things that you're constantly trying to, you know, make... Because sleep is a... Sleep is by nature an unconscious thing. Yeah, well, this is this it's is even this is even how I feel. I have to explain to people that because I for a long time on this show I've talked I talk about how much I love the Fitbit or tools like that, and mm -hmm. I and I promote using things like that. The problem is that some people take it so literally. I would say your average person. Yeah, and I so mean the, they hang on every number, and so I, I, I and and they're always so concerned. Well, how accurate is it? Is this or it said that? It's just like whoa. The idea is, it's there, there's such great tools, and even the sleep stuff that Doug's talking about. It's like I I think they're all positive, awesome tools. I mean, it's it's data that us as trainers 15 years ago didn't have that. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, if I have something that my client can come back and say, hey, Adam, I've been using that app you told me, and I guess I get horrible sleep. Or, hey, Adam, I've been using the Fitbit and wearing it around, and I averaged 4,000 steps, and it's saying that my body... that re As a trainer for coaching, oh, my God, like that just... Mm -hmm. That takes all the guessing out of it for me, and even if it's not precise, I at least now have a, a general idea of... 
this person's daily movement, calorie expenditure, intake, and then what they're sleeping. It's interesting. I've given this a lot of thought because I do feel the same way about technology and how valuable a lot of the feedback is. But at the same time, I even find myself just always it, it, like I can't keep fixating on it. There's like a three to four week sort of period where I'm like, okay, I get it. Like you can kind of understand where you are currently. And I think it's important to kind of assess or like almost have a phase where like, that's part of the process of like, I'm focusing on, you know, gathering all this data. Now I have to implement a plan and, and, and work on those specific things, come back and revisit it later and, and kind of see where I'm at in order to, uh, yeah, cause you can, you can get competitive with it like if it's telling me my my score is low that's gonna like build a little anxiety you know subconsciously right. with me yeah I've, it's we see this all the time with people who who count macros religiously and yes. do it all the time it becomes that itself becomes a stress that is, itself isn't it funny health. there seems to be in that too right there seems to be these two camps either you're extreme and pro it or you're extreme anti it mm -hmm. it's like you no know, there's i think there's this middle ground of you know there's a great there's a lot of great things that come from tracking and counting and weighing and measuring and learning about the, f the food that you're intaking on a regular basis. But then there's something to be said about, you know, becoming so attached to that that you can't just relax and go out and, and have this. A this applies yeah. to anything, any kind of objective information. You can completely, it can totally contribute to more stress and more anxiety. I remember as a as a in my 20s when i really started to become interested in world affairs when i really got interested into politics and economics there was like a two year period where current affairs <laughs> yeah, remember that yeah there was a period where it made me wait like two years way more anxious and way more paranoid just because i became so much more aware mm -hmm. of all the shit that was happening around me and then i had to kind of unplug and disconnect and find this kind of balance where I know information, but now I know how to manage, you know, how it affects me. I mean, if you go to a, a psychologist and you and you tell them that you're super anxious, and one of the one of the things they may say to you is, stop watching the news. Yeah. Because being so hyper aware of everything that's around you can contribute to that. And all these these objective, uh, measurable statistics that we use in health and fitness can totally become that. Yeah. We see it a lot in our space, in the hardcore fitness space, when you see the you know, bikini competitors or bodybuilders or trainers or just fitness fanatics, they become so fixated on measurable, you know, objective statistics that they their fitness and nutrition and health no longer improve the quality of life. It actually becomes a detriment. I know a lot of people like this. I know a lot of people where their workouts have to happen at the exact same time. They have to have the exact same right type of nutrition. If their macros are, if they don't count macros, I coach people like this all the time. Like I'll tell them, okay, we're not going to count macros for a week, and it causes tremendous anxiety in them. Yeah, because well, they, the they know they go way yeah. overboard afterwards, or they, they just don't know. Yeah. Like I got to count, I got to measure everything. And then what I'll do is I'll sell, I'll tell them we're not going to aim for any targets, but I want you to just kind of tell me what you've been eating. And you know what they end up doing? Eating the same thing every day because they're so afraid of veering <laughs> yeah. off anything. And so these things cause that that type of stress. And it's funny how that affects your, your health. Like like Doug was saying, he tried to get better sleep and it made his sleep a lot worse. Well, this is one of those things too <clears throat> that always makes it challenging as a coach um, or trainer to to help people because there's there, there, it always depends on who I'm talking to on if I think this is a, a positive thing or a negative thing for you. And so when we get like on the mics and we, we share stuff like this, I always try to be really careful on like how much I'm I'm pro something or how much yeah. I'm anti something. Because, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the client, I, I, I see like, man, this is like so there's certain people that I have to have you track. It's necessary. It's mm -hmm. like you need to do that because you don't have any clue whatsoever what you're what you're consuming, and I need to make you aware of it. Then there's other people, like you said, and I've trained a lot of these people that are bikini competitors and have been weighing and measuring food or other fitness professionals that have become so attached to it that, that they have this really bad relationship with it. And those people, it's like, I don't want you to even think about tracking. Yeah. So, And I feel like that's kind of almost everything we talk about. It really, yeah. I really feel, and that, I think you know, we were talking the other day, um, uh, Danny and I, and we were just talking about uh, you know, part of Mind Pump's message, and I refer to us as being kind of like the whistleblowers of the fitness industry. Like somebody need to come out and tell all these fucking gurus 
that you're all wrong and you're all right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's it's it they is need to be checked. No, that's and what you're it, all that's right. what it is. Because yeah. what we what we try and do is we try to get we try and get into these uh, you know these camps and it, my way is better than your way and it's like well. The reality of it is there's such a huge individual variance amongst mm-hmm. all of us as humans that, you know, almost all of these camps, there's certain things that, that they they talk to as like foundational or bricks or must haves that, yeah, it applies to a certain percentage of those people. But then it's totally the opposite message that I'd probably want to give to another yeah. percentage. And of there's people. so many different methods and tools that are super valuable, but you find that it, it, like it has no value with somebody or it has value down the road with somebody. And so it's, it's discerning all of that as a coach. Um, that's why for me, it's always been, it's, it's frustrating to speak in general terms of like, you know, like what you should focus on. It, it, it always seems like, um, you know, for me as a trainer, I, I would kind of lead with that. And then I would find all this information out. I'm like, Oh no, no, that's not what we need to be doing. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I really started focusing on the assessment portion and, and spending way more time gathering information. And that way it's like, you can, based off of my limited knowledge at the time, like now, if I went back and I was like to, to sort of plug, uh, certain specific tools and, and methods, uh, for individual, I feel like I'd be much more effective because I could say, well, in this situation, a keto diet makes a whole lot of sense, you know, based off of what you just told me. And, and, you know, you could kind of plug in and and play and match. It's all about how you, you say things, you know, what you say is important, but how you say it is as important, if not more important. Like, for example, if I tell somebody consistency with your workout is extremely important, okay? Now, what if somebody took that to heart and could not miss a single workout and it totally, you know, took away from their quality of life? Mm-hmm. I could, or I could say consistency extreme is extremely important with your workout. For the most part, be very, very consistent, but I also want you to be okay with missing a few workouts if you go on vacations and stuff like that. Like how you communicate. I remember for me, like there there were a couple huge breakthroughs with my own personal health and fitness. One of them was being able to not work out when I go on vacation. That was huge. I remember the first vacation I went on, it was a week long. Uh, I went to Italy and I had plans. You know, we went to this small town uh, in Italy where my ex-wife is from. And in that small town, there's, we didn't have a car. We would walk everywhere. And there was one gym that I would work out at. And I had remembered it from the previous vis- time we had visited. Well, it, that gym had closed down. So I was screwed. Panic. Nowhere to work out. So I don't work out for, actually it was two weeks. I don't work out for two weeks. And it was extremely liberating. Now, did I lose some strength and all that stuff? I did. But when I came back, it came right back mm-hmm. very quickly. The other time I got blown away was the first times I started messing around with fasting and muscle didn't just melt off my body. I was so rigid and in, in, in stuck on the fact that I had to eat every three hours and I had to have this much protein every single day or I was going to lose all this muscle. Then I fasted and I lost no muscle. I felt fine. In fact, I felt great. And I was able to kind of break these chains from all these things that was actually, I didn't realize at the time, was causing me more stress than it was taken away and so it's important. The way you communicate these things is very, very important. I hate to say everything's about balance because mm-hmm. that's so pl- overplayed, but it's it's totally true. And it's especially true when it comes to – so, you know, when you take the average person who has zero idea what they're doing, it's a, it's important to track at first just so you know. You know, you, right. you have to know. Like, if, oh, how much sugar are you eating? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Let's find out. Let's look. Wow, you're eating a lot of sugar. Let's try cutting that down a little bit. But then at some point, you want to move away from the constant – counting and, and tracking and, and rigidity yeah. of, you know, these types of things. Because, I mean, imagine if you went to the doctor and you got blood work every week. You know what I mean? Oh, I got to change this. I got to change. I mean, yeah. it would be so stressful. Oh, yeah. It'd be a stressful situation. So it becomes, uh, the, the solution then becomes the problem. And so the message needs to be communicated in a way, and I, you know, that's something that I think, you know, we try to do all the time, mm-hmm. <laughs> it needs to be communicated communicated in a way where, people uh, get more of what, what's really going to benefit them long-term 
and less of the flashbang, you know, here's what's cool, here's what's going to work for the next 30 days, but never work again for you type of deal. So. Yeah. Did you guys see the post that uh, I went back and forth with David Alexander, the the trainer that trains all the pro athletes over in Florida? No. So you were telling it, he deleted the whole thing, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. No, it got, it was a hit. When he deleted it, I think it had like 45 or 50,000 views, like over four or 500 comments. He deleted the whole post? Yeah, he did. Oh, wow. And it, what, what he did? What, what happened? Well, he, he he put a post. That he 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 he's took a a video from somebody else's page, and it looks like it's another trainer in Florida who has a small following. I think they only had like eight or ten thousand followers, but a, a, probably a competitor in the area. And he did a video of it, and he says, "Can someone please tell me why this is being done? I mean, seriously, I want to know why. I'm not attacking or shitting or criticizing on this person. I would just like to learn from a scientific physiology, mathematical hell, any damn place, really." And he goes on and on to talk about this this guy doing a Jefferson curl. And I just just made a statement under or he didn't know what it was. He says, Why, what is it? And I and I put underneath there, it's a Jefferson's curl. And, you know, most people don't have uh, the mobility to to do a movement like this, but it has its applications. And that's all I said. And then he like responded to me with this, you know, cut and paste of uh Stu Stu McGill uh, uh quote. And I, which I love all of McGill's stuff. I think he's a brilliant, uh, brilliant man. And I think what he was saying was correct, but he also cherry picked information to support what he was trying to say. And it's like, mm. well, if you've listened to or read more of what McGill has said, he, he doesn't say he's it, probably speaking more to the average person. Yeah, he is. He's saying athlete. And which is what I said too. It's like uh, 99% of all clientele ever trained. I would never teach a Jefferson's curl to maybe the handful of gymnasts that I've trained. Those are the people that I would train that because it's very sport specific. Mm -hmm. Like nobody else is going to really need to be able to take something that, that to that range of motion with a, a weight loaded. Yeah, yeah. Loaded. Range right. Yeah. So, that was kind of my, my debate, and I kind of jabbed a little bit out of him because I, I was just like, you know, that was a lot of words to try and prove your point, you know, that he copied and pasted us. And then if you're also going to cite McGill, you should cite what he finished saying about that, which is exactly what I said, and that there's an application for it. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, you know, and, and again, it just it's this elitist attitude that we all seem to have in this space that drives me fucking crazy is that, you know, we think that our method, our way, and the reason I think it why it, it, it kind of – irritated me a little bit is because if if we're going to talk about what's healthiest for people and for the average person that's one conversation and then if we're going to talk about performance it's another conversation also yep and a guy who's trains professional athletes and that's his expertise and what he's great at i don't even have to see what you're teaching and i already know your job when you train a professional athlete is to not correct all their dysfunction and imbalances and fix those people it's to enhance what they've already built upon for 20 plus years of playing their sport over and over and fortify the joints to to preserve their career really. right yeah. so from getting hurt right yeah. so, and so if you're training basketball players and i know this because I've, I've been following him for a long time and i like a lot of the stuff that he puts out i really do especially when it's sports specific types of talk and you're doing quarter squats with basketball players that have, you know, fucking an asymmetrical shift and pronating in their feet. Like, you're not trying to fix that. I get that. You wouldn't want to because then that would that would actually take away from their performance on the court. So how are you going to pull the sliver out of somebody else's eye for doing like a Jefferson curl? That's a very sport specific type of movement, like for gymnasts, when you're over here teaching stuff for professional athletes. Like, it's the right. same fucking thing. Yeah. 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 When it comes to exercise and movement. Uh, if you can do a movement, and this is this statement is true for anything. If, if you can do a movement with good control and good stability and good mobility, okay. So you have to have those three things: so good control, stability, and mobility. Then that movement's okay. That's it. Mm. I don't care what the movement is. I really don't care. It could be the craziest movement of all time. If you, the person doing it, has really good control and stability throughout the movement, throughout the entire movement, they own it and good mobility, it's fine. Mm. Now, exercises come with a benefit and risk. Uh, All of them. And, and some exercises have a lot of risk and very little benefit to that risk. And other exercises have a lot of benefit and very little risk. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with athletes, a lot of times you're playing in that lot of, you know, the, you're, a lot of times you're playing with the high risk, some benefit, because you're, you're trying to improve the performance. Yeah. It's like, look, you know, 
if I'm if I'm if I'm trying to make a a a, a drag car go faster in the quarter mile and it's already doing a six second quarter mile. I'm going to do things to that car that are going to give it a little bit of benefit, but increase the risk a lot. Like, okay, let's increase, you know, let's increase the pressure even more in this engine. What's the risk? It's going to explode, but we may squeeze out 0.2, you know, uh, seconds out of the quarter mile. Well, you're, if you're a sports performance guy, you're the wrong guy to be calling out what's healthy and what's not healthy. Yeah, sports are not healthy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. wake up, everybody! No, like it's risk management. Is, it's, is, is, sports is not a healthy thing for the body. It's not. No. It's a fact. Doing anything repetitively or over, just pushing your body to yeah, any limits. Yes, to push pushing your body to extreme limits and and then and doing anything repetitively over and over and over again, especially when it's not balanced on the body, is not ideal and healthy. And eventually, like let's let's talk about where all these athletes, these great athletes that you're probably training right now are at in 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like because most of the training that you, that you do for these athletes are not about health and longevity. It's about performance and getting the most out of their body, which is awesome. And I'm not shitting on it. I think it's fucking rad that how far we've evolved as humans and we can teach ourselves to jump up and dunk a basketball in mm -hmm. 360 and do cool shit, but that's not healthy. No, no we're, we're pressing the boundaries. <laughs> so like, we yeah, want to see where the, the human potential lies. It's and, a great and, point. You're pressing the boundaries. So yeah. how could you get somebody who's pressing the boundaries on something that's like that's obviously the, like a Jefferson curl is the boundaries of yeah. your spine. Yeah, you know, like that, like they are like definitely expressing the boundaries. But you, you look at gymnastics. What are they doing? They're under an extreme amount of stress in very uh, extreme ranges of motion. Yeah, and so you got to build strength. In you that. have to because if they don't. How are they going to get out of these positions that yeah. they put themselves in? And they have to put themselves in those positions because it's part of the sport and they're being judged on it. And so as a coach, you need to be able to get them strong in these movements. And so, yes, it's it's a great point. It's it's something that especially if that's not in your in your realm uh, if it's in a different sport entirely, they're going to have a whole another standard to abide right. by. Have right. you have you how many athletes have you met who were 20 and 30 years post-retirement right how do they move oh terrible I Yikes. the worst i mean like the most dysfunction i ever saw in clients were my athletes and the higher the level the more dysfunction oh, oh yeah. i mean you meet a you meet a 50 or 60 year old guy or girl who was a professional high level high intensity type athlete and just watch them walk Many of them look like they, they've either had replacements of joints, they're moving like they're 100 years old, mm -hmm. they're on painkillers, um, and some sports are worse than others. You know, football players and boxers tend to be worse off than, you know, swimmers or whatever. But there's, it, it's just, you're, it's an extreme level of, of performance. You're pushing your body to the limit. So like, you know, like for example, for myself, I love to train for maximal strength. Guess what's probably going to be something that's going to end up going away for me soon? Training for maximal strength. It doesn't make sense for me to push my body to, you know, deadlift 550 pounds at max intensities as I start to get older because the the benefit I'm going to get out of that is small. Am I going to get some benefit from it? Sure, I'll get a little bit more muscle, a little stronger. The risk is much higher. And the fact that yeah. I've been doing it now that for- That keeps increasing. And it keeps increasing. And so it's like when you see, you know, some of our friends on Instagram who keep hurting themselves over and over again. Like, well, yeah. yeah, you've been pushing your body- now for 10, 15 years, you know, at some point you got to kind of scale it back a little bit and you got to look a little, you know, which I'm, I'm okay with that too. As There's long nothing wrong with it. There is nothing wrong, especially when you, Hey, that's what I'm my, I'm trying to be the best athlete in the world. I don't give a fuck. I'm not thinking about, I want to live an extra two years. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking about, I want to be the best athlete. Totally fine. I get yeah, it. Yeah. You know what I'm now, saying? There's now with, with the Jefferson curl, I mean, I think, I think it's important too, to, to be specific on that. First of all, if the average person saw a Jefferson curl, they'd freak out because it looks like... Well, they should. Yeah, it looks yeah. like you're lifting something in the way you were taught not to, right? So basically, you're standing up tall and you're holding a barbell and while keeping your legs straight, you bend over, but you do it in a way to where you're really rounding your entire back and you're you're, you're really rounding the whole body. So right, you're trying to articulate each uh, vertebrae and right. like pull up with your spine in a sense. Right, now here's why it's dangerous for a lot of people because when people push their spine to that level of uh, articulation they end up relying on the joints of the spine itself to support them so mm -hmm. they'll push their body to that limit and then what's supporting them is the joint so it's no different than fully extending my elbow but then locking my elbow 
almost relaxing the muscles that are supporting in that position, but still being able to keep my elbow locked because the joint itself mm. is now in a position where it's locked. Now, if I add resistance to that, obviously, if I keep adding resistance, my elbow is going to go backwards. The, the force is going to go right into the joint. Right. Same thing with my knees. If I lock my knees and then kind of relax the muscles so they're not supporting the joint, I'm going to look like a flamingo if I add too much uh, you know, resistance. So the key with the Jefferson curl is to articulate all that extreme movement, but have control for uh, uh, the whole time mm -hmm. and not allow the joints to support you, but rather the muscles that are supporting the joints. So in order to do that, you got to have a really good body awareness. You just oh, do. Yeah. You have to really know your body and yeah. know how far to go and how to control all these little joints of the spine. And if you can do all that, a Jefferson curl is a fucking awesome exercise. But guess how many people <laughs> out of 100 have that kind of control? Yeah, well, Not I mean, even 1%. That's yeah. what I said. 99% of the people have no business doing it. But I feel the same way about a, a quarter squat. You know, 99% of the people have no business doing that either. Right. You right, know? right but we, we still teach it for specific reasons for athletes. And it, is, it does have its application for them. And it is a no-brainer for those athletes. But... It's not for everybody else. I feel like that about plyometrics. Ply I, yeah. I, plyometrics have been uh, bastardized mm, now yeah. for too fucking long. It's way been, too misused. It, it's just if I go into any gym, I'm, I'm going to see some knucklehead trainer having their clients jump on shit or jump over shit because it makes them tired. Um, and it's like there's no reason. There's absolutely no. The, they're not going to gain. First of all, they don't have enough control to, to, to gain from that exercise. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is dramatically increasing the risk of their workouts. But do plyometrics have a have an application for fucking high-level athletes who have good control and we're trying to work on power? Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Plyometrics are a game changer if done properly for a lot of people. But most people, don't waste your time. Right, right. You know, time. that reminds me of uh, something that you brought up the other day that you wanted to talk about, which I think is a good transition, is, you know, uh, rest periods. Mm. Um, the most under modified variable i i think so too man one of my favorite things actually when i get somebody who's been like training very very consistently for a long time is to kind of monitor how they their pace and like time it without them really under knowing that i'm doing it you know go at your pace here and i'm just gonna i'm gonna stop watch it and then i can see because we we all tend to do this and just like the way we gravitate to the same type of exercises that we love to do so much we also gravitate towards a specific rest period and the longer you've been training the more likely you've probably been stuck in a rest period and mm -hmm. you just never see or not never you rarely ever see somebody carrying a stopwatch or looking up at the clock to actually you know hold themselves accountable to a 60 second a 90 second a 30 second 100 they, yeah, people will count reps they'll count sets they'll pay attention to the exercises that they're doing but very few people will actually you know, look at and, and count their rest periods and modify. Their, it's a variable. It's one of the variables in your workouts that mm -hmm. you should modify and play with because your body will respond. You could, I mean, I learned this. I remember the first time I figured this out. I was, uh, I don't remember how old I was. I was a kid. I was probably 18, 19 years old. And I think I was 19 or, uh, and I was working out. And I had a uh, I had a meeting with my district manager. So it was 19. This is when I was managing one of the first gyms that I, that I managed. So I was out there working out. And for whatever reason, I got started late. I think I had to talk to one of my front desk uh, staff members. And so what ended up turning what, what it was supposed to be an hour workout. And and I had I knew exactly how long my workouts would take. And I ended up with like 35 minutes. And I'm the kind of person I hate doing half my workout and not finishing the half. I just can't stand it. So I'm like, shit, I have 35 minutes. I got to do this whole workout. Uh, my district manager is going to be here in 35 minutes. So I can't, you know, I, I got to meet with them. So I went out there and I cut all my rest periods in half. Now I didn't time them, but I definitely worked out a lot faster and I, I couldn't go as heavy as a result, right? I can't do as many reps with the second and third set because rather than resting a minute and a half, I'm resting 30 seconds or 40 seconds. And so I started doing this. I did this for the whole workout. And I remember the pump that I had from the workout. And then I remember how I felt the day after. And then I maintained this faster pace for like a few weeks. And I saw my body change. And that's when it dawned on me. It's like, oh my God, why am I not messing with rest periods like I do with all everything else in my training? And so it's just, and it's easy. This is such an easy one. Like yeah. you don't have to get complicated with your workouts. Just look at your rest periods and say, okay, this week I'm resting 
you know, and he, by the way, for a lot of people, this is this is the funny part. For a lot of, I, I would say, I'm going to be a little generalized here. Mm. I found that my female clients had a tougher time with the long rest periods, yeah, yeah. and my male clients had a tougher time with the short rest periods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you guys find that? They want to get shit done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're in there to work, and yeah, that was always the case. I was always trying to kind of, okay, it's okay to relax. Like, let's, you know, take our time, and like, okay, what's next? Okay, what's next? Okay, yeah. what's next? And, uh, you know- I'm ready. That was very, very, <laughs> yeah, very much like, uh, you know, something that was common amongst uh, a lot of the females I trained. Well, because it feeds into the whole aerobics type thing. You yep. know? I, mean, I need I, to burn body fat. Yeah, right? that's been marketed the most yeah, yeah circuit training and aerobics classes have been marketed to them so much for so long that it's just it's in their nature i still i mean I, I i train one client right now and you know she loves to go take orange theory and so when she gets me it's like i, I always have to like stop her like no rest <laughs> yeah i know you i know you can go back and do it again but rest yeah you know i want you to, i want you to rest and if it's that easy then i'm gonna put more weight on this motherfucker yeah it's so. a, we need to communicate why it's a variable that's important to to mess with because because rest is like your sets in the set in this in the in the sense that your rest periods will change how your your workouts affect your body yeah so uh if you rest longer it affects everything else if you rest longer you're going to be stronger with your sets and be able to lift much heavier. If you rest, if you cut your rest periods shorter, you're not able to lift as heavy, but you are going to build more lactic acid in the muscles. Uh, you are going to create more waste products, um, and you're going to increase the what they, what's it called transient sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which just a, a way for me to sound real smart. In reality, it just means pump. <laughs> you're just going to Im- increase the pump or improve the pump, and the pump itself has its own benefits. And I mean, we can get real complicated and talk about all the energy systems and all yeah, that stuff. The, the well, you can do that in a simple way. You can do that in a simple way. And I used to to do that to explain that to people is when every time that we sit down and we rest between sets uh, or what's, every time we exercise, we do movement, our body uses energy molecules. It breaks down ATP and ADP, right? It utilizes that in order to pr- perform that set. When you sit down and you rest your body is naturally starting to replenish that storage. So mm-hmm. the and the longer you rest and it maxes out at about 3 minutes is what the most of the studies point to. So once you hit that 3 minute mark, the difference between 3 minutes and 4 minutes and 5 minutes mm-hmm. isn't a, a major difference. But there is a major difference between 3 minutes, 2 minutes, 1 minute, 30 seconds on how much more your body replenishes for you to have to go into the next set. Mm-hmm. So what most people that and and what I re- normally recommend before you try and manipulate your time is to first track it like anything else I re- normally recommend is figure out where you're at and then I normally push people to the opposite end of the spectrum so they can really see the benefits. So you know, regardless, I, we we did a overgeneralization of you know women tend to do this, men tend to that, but there, there's exceptions to those rules. So what's more important is find out where you are. Are you the guy or girl who sits on their phone or spends a lot of time between rest periods, and you tend to push the two and a half minute beyond mark between mm-hmm. sets? Or are you the person that tends to lean closer to the 30 second to one minute mark? And whichever one you are, go to the opposite end of the spectrum. If you're yeah. somebody who is, you know, used to the fast rest periods and you rarely ever rest longer than a minute and a half, maybe two tops, well, then do three minute rest periods and see what that and increase weight. Cause you're gonna see you're gonna be able to increase way more weight. If you're somebody who fast, fast, fast and you've gotten really good at that and then all of a sudden you decide to give yourself long rest periods, watch how much stronger you are set after set yeah. after set and really pay attention to your composure like uh, especially if you're new to you know a certain workout or just like new in general to coming into the gym i was always having to um have them really pay attention to when they felt like they could they were recovered and they and then they could come back to the uh to the exercise with the the proper mechanics and they, they were able to you, you know maintain that composure and be able to perform uh the lift versus just like a, a very specific time and and i would time it out but this is as a coach i would look and pay attention to you know how long it took them to even uh you know recover fully in terms of being able to communicate back with me and they're not breathing heavy, uh, you know, they're not shaky, like all these sort of like indications of, okay, let's, okay, now again, here's here's the next set. That's such a great, such a great point because I think it's important to communicate that for beginners. I usually use a long rest period. Now, it's not because the long rest period is better or worse. 
it's because with a beginner, uh, their form is it's so hard to get them to, to move properly anyway that I want to get rid of every obstacle that's going to prevent them from moving really well. And fatigue is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't have them, if I have them rest too short, then they're fatigued and their form breaks down. And in the beginning with the beginner, my goal is like, I got to get you to move right. And, and really anything I throw at you is going to work, but I need you to move right so that later on when we're pushing your body, mm -hmm. you've got good movement patterns. It's later on that I start to mess with the, with the rest periods where I can, I can shorten them because now they've got those good those good solid foundation and you know, your body basics. will respond in, in all new ways. And so that's, what's so powerful about it. Well, so here's what I hate about studies with, with fitness. This is the thing. And, and I'm, you know, I, I, I'm really grateful that I have as much experience as I have in fitness. Cause it's allowed me to view all other studies in realms. I don't have an expertise in, uh, more uh, with more of a skeptical eye. So here's what I'm talking about. If you were to look up, what rest period builds the most muscle? Yeah, and burns the most fat. Yeah. yeah. If you look up the, those two things, you're going to find two different answers. But let's just talk about building muscle. If I look up mm. what rest period builds the most muscle, here's what you're going to find. Long rest periods build the most muscle. You know, two, three-minute rest periods, one and a half minutes maybe for people who have more, more condition. But essentially what they say in the studies is longer rest periods are better they, you're stronger, you replenish more ATP, which is the form that energy that Adam was talking about. And they build more muscle in these six to 12 week studies when they compare them to short rest periods. And that is absolutely true. hundred mm -hmm. percent. If we were just solely to compare head to head rest periods for six we, weeks and we yeah, were, for that amount of time yeah, and we were never going to change anything. And we're just like, okay, here's where you're going to stay for the rest of your life. Yeah. And you just want, you want to build muscle and you want to maximize what weights do for you. Sure. The longer rest periods are going to work a little bit better, but there's there's some some other things you need to know. The other rest periods also work. Now, when you compare them head to head, the longer rest periods build more muscle, but that doesn't mean the other ones don't build muscle too. They also do. And here's the second part: at some point, whatever you're doing, if you do it all the time and you don't change it, it stops working right completely. So if I were to take uh, and, and extend that study out for a year, and then I were to compare two groups and say this group over here focuses on a, a 30 second rest period for four weeks and then moves to a 90 second rest period for four weeks and moves to a you know 120 you know a second rest period and then goes back down and then this other group over here they just do the long rest period the whole time what you'll find is the one that cycles through the different rest periods will have uh, better results which because is the exact same thing that we find in the studies that talk about rep ranges yep. exact mm -hmm. same thing there if you go look at studies for what rep ranges burn the most fat or what rep ranges burn them or build the most muscle they're gonna say in a you know hey this one builds like reps that are for building muscle are the you know eight to twelve rep range well yeah that's true like you said in a six week study <laughs> But over the course of a year, give me the client that I've now rotated through, you know, hypertrophy, strength, power, and endurance training, which I'm I'm manipulating reps as low as one all the way up to 15 to 20, and I'm cycling them through every four to six weeks over the course of a year, and I'll build way more muscle in that person. Mm -hmm. So I, it's the exact same thing. I mean, you just so that being said, with with the rest periods, how often do you guys recommend people to vary it, and then? Do you tend to vary it with anything else? Like, do you like to phase, like when you phase or transition like we do in maps or do you, do you like to say, okay, for a whole program, we're going to stick to, you know, so for a whole 12 weeks, we're going to stick to a rest period and then we're going to switch to another, like, how do you guys normally like to? So I, I, I typically will phase rest periods the same way I'll phase, uh, rep ranges. So it's typically anywhere between three to five weeks maybe. Um, but, and I like to, I also like to combine, variables uh, and, and help them multiply their effects. So what I mean by that is if my goal, if the rep range I'm in is the low rep range, which is great for strength, then I'm going to combine that with a longer rest period, which is yeah, also some great for strength. some pair a lot ni more nicely than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to combine you know variables that all speak to the same type of goal. If I'm trying to work on the pump, which is higher rep ranges or endurance, then I'm going to also typically shorten the rep ranges. And here's a good rule of thumb. Change the rest period, and then once you start to get good at it, change it again. Literally, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Like Once you start to feel like you're getting good at it, yeah. 
then just change it. Which you, is the hard part, right? It sucks. Yeah. It yeah. sucks because it suck. I know when I shorten my rest periods, it's like my workouts are, oh my God, I'm dying. Mm-hmm. And then I start to get good at them. And it's like, okay, well, it's time to change it again. You know, one of my favorite things to do with a client is change the rest period from short to long because it's counterintuitive for them. Like if I get a client and they're they're so used to resting, you know, 20, 30 seconds in between sets. Yeah. And they say, we're going to rest a minute and a half. They're always like, uh, but I'm going to like lose progress. I'm gonna lose, my workout's going to feel easier. I'm not going to. And I love that one because it's so counterintuitive. I'll have them rest longer and then we'll, you know, measure body fat and strength and all that stuff. And they'll, like, I, I can't believe I'm building muscle. I'm getting leaner. This is weird. Yeah. I feel like my workouts aren't as hard. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah. You know, we're for wrestling. the most part, like, I, yeah, I totally agree. And I, I do very similar, uh, you know, my thought process with that, especially with like the multiple reps and then and having shorter rest periods in terms of what adaptation I'm typically seeking with that. Uh, but there is, um, when, when I do have like a, an athlete or somebody that's trying to learn a very specific skill, uh, you know, there's times where we'll do like, you know, multiple, multiple reps, but there's long rest periods yeah. in between. And you know that for Good me, point. that's that's. I mean, th- there's 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 different ways to, to to play with it, but that's that's when I found very effective because then we're really like sharpening the skill and we're we're repeating the pattern of it, but then we're not degrading uh, by adding fatigue a, a, as a component. No, what a great point. I think you're when you're perfecting a skill, you want to you want to rest for a long period of time. Once you perfect well, a skill and you're solid. There may be some merit into learning how to maintain that skill under fatigue. Yes, but that's more of an advanced thing. Yeah, right? and I think too, and, and and this is where when we're programming, I know people f- try to point out like inconsistencies, you know, in the way that we like with performance or anabolic or certain things that they're looking at um, in terms of how we programmed it and, and the why. I think they're just really trying to unpack the why, and you know, with plyometrics especially, it's it's. It, it is that's more of a I look at that more as a skill and so we're really trying to refine uh, the process of being able to generate force and, and under control and it takes a lot of practice mm-hmm. yeah. and so but you do need rest and you need to to be efficient in that process so that's why you'd see you know on some exercises uh, more reps uh, but you, you have to really pay attention to the composure and in and, and, and the rest period of that. Well, I agree 100% with you guys. I think I typically gravitate towards, you know, what tends to pair the best. But then that also varies and changes based off of who I'm training. So if I have somebody who I think is like me and gets that, and when they're strength training, they like to give their long rest periods because they like to see themselves hit PRs and push, Mm -hmm. and and they do that and they've been training for a long time, those sometimes are the best candidates to say, hey, you know what I'm going to do th- with strength phase, this phase in MAPS, you know, our first phase, where normally I'd be giving you three-minute rest periods, we're going to really shorten those up. Why? Because you've never done it, yeah. you know? So that's it. That's the thing about, you know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about where, yeah, the studies would prove that this is the better way. And this is the problem, I think, that that for the average consumer that's you know, digesting a lot of the information that that's getting presented by all these gurus and professionals is, you know, they'll cite a study that says, oh, this. So when you strength train, you should rest like this because this is where you'll build the most muscle. Well, I don't know if you've been doing that for quite some time. That's not true anymore. Oh, my God. Context matters. Yeah. uh, So much. It's not even funny. It's it's like, you know, it's like a it's when nutrition, you know, I, I could say studies show that eating a diet that contains uh, adequate carbohydrates will make you perform better on the field. You'll have better strength. You'll have better endurance and better performance. And that's true in studies. But what if I got somebody with really bad you know, gut health issues and one of the ways that they feel better is to avoid carbohydrates? Which diet's going to make them perform better? A diet that's got higher carbohydrates or one that's very low in carbohydrates? Well, that for that particular person, mm-hmm. the lower carbohydrate diet is going to improve their performance. That's why we see people like like Jordan Peterson, who's on this carnivore diet, and he's like, I feel amazing. Well, yes, you do feel amazing because you felt so shitty eating all these other foods. But for most people who are fine eating all these other foods, right. going carnivore is going to make them feel worse. Right. Yeah. And the same is true for, for training. Um, it, you know, I want to go back to the whole you know, perfecting the skill and not uh, you know, throwing the, 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 ver- the fatigue on top of it. You know, it makes me think of um, high-level uh, soldiers. Hmm. When when you see like a, a, a an army ranger or navy seal, 
you know, learning to fire their gun under extreme duress. Like, just sleep deprived, fucking cold as shit. You got your, your, your commanders yelling in your ear and throwing sand in your face and you got to hit a target with your gun. That came after <laughs> lots of training under perfect, quiet, simple conditions. Yeah. First, let me perfect and master the skill of shooting this gun. Well, not only that, they had to uh, basically take the entire gun apart first and then put it all back together perfectly, oil it perfectly, like almost like make their own bullets. You know, like <laughs> they, they went to that level of detail. So you're so in tune with that well, don't, process. Don't, don't they Don't they say something like your your gun's like a part of you? It is. Yeah, and, it's right? an appendage. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So they, that's what they, they train you to become so one yeah, but they with your gun before they even ask you to go, you know, take, you know, whizzing bullets by your head or throwing sand in your face or doing that stuff. That all comes first. Well, think about, uh, let's think about a very simple um, action that requires uh, not a whole lot of skill for most people. Walking, right? Walking for most people doesn't take a whole lot of concentration and skill because we've been doing it since you know we were you know two years old and so if you're really 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 tired can you still walk yeah you probably can now think of something that's very very complex a very complex skill juggling something would you be able to juggle uh, when you're really really tired probably not because the higher the skill level the the more mm -hmm. difficult it is to do <laughs> under yeah. duress and so what you know what Justin was saying about you know beginners and resting long, long periods of time to perfect their form, totally true. In that case, I would just say practice your skill, rest a long period of time. Don't worry about messing with the energy systems and pushing your body with rest periods because you got to get really good. But once you get good at movements, man, it is – I love then, messing with Then it's on. Yeah. Then it's yeah, on. Yeah. I love it. I love it because – Now let's get creative. It's the, it's the most simple black and white variable I can think about. Like rep ranges – more complex. Okay, what rep ranges? How do I stay within them? Exercises even more complex. Which ones do I combine? How do I do the one? You know, whatever. I've been doing this one for a long time. Which one should I move to? Um, rest periods easy. Yeah. You know, you could literally keep your workout exactly the same, same everything, right. same exercise. And then just go to the other end of the spectrum. That's it. Yeah. You're probably gonna have to change the weight that you're lifting. Oh yeah. But <laughs> your but your rest period just change that alone. And what you may notice is your body starts to respond and it's funny to me how that one's the one that people fuck with the last the least it's i yeah. never see it no i i never see it never yeah. see somebody like looking up at the clock or using a stopwatch and it's such an easy like you said it's one of the easiest variables for you to to manipulate i appreciate it for me personally i mean there's times when i know I, you know i don't necessarily want to lift heavy but i want to get a good workout i know i have good form um you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, and this is how I do it, by the way. I don't use a stopwatch. I count in my head. So I'll do and it keeps me in the moment. It's one of the reasons why I do it because if I if I don't do that, I tend to get lost. Yeah. So I'll do my set, I'll rack the weight, and then I'll go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Well, you know what's kind of old school, which I used to see some clients uh, use and apply, and I would see this sometimes in the gym, but it definitely was not popular. Uh, people would actually do the pulse check. And they would watch the clock and then wait till their heart rate oh, came yeah. back down to a certain, you know, manageable level. And, and that, I, I mean, I could see value in that uh, in, in terms of if you figured out like, OK, around this range is where I feel the most productive. Uh, you know, that that could be, a, you know, a measure, a, a valuable sort of a metric to kind of apply. Well, these are all the things that um, I really started to appreciate on a whole other level when I was competing because. The average person, if you're just well, gosh, you're tracking everything, at right? That point. And and that's what I'm where I, what I'm alluding to right now is that, you know, do I track? Or do I am I messing with my rest periods a lot right now? No, you know, I'm to me like going to the working out right now is more therapeutic, and I'm enjoying it, and it, I'm in the moment, and I'm not carrying a stopwatch because I I don't care if I'm not progressing very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not. But I know a lot of people, especially right now, it's January time are trying to progress or trying to change their body. I don't, every time I work out, it's not always like that. But when I was competing, it was. When I was competing, I was always, every workout, I wanted to be better. You know, I wanted to look better. I wanted to perform better. I wanted to be better on all levels every single time I came to the gym. So these were the things that 100% I was tracking and manipulating. So if you're somebody 
who's trying to make progress and trying to change your physique or improve, this is a, a very important variable to to measure, track, and to manipulate. Uh, and if, if for somebody who already is in great shape and you're consistent and you love going to the gym, like yeah, you know, carrying a stopwatch around, uh, maybe maybe it would be less enjoyable uh, enjoyable for you. Enjoy bubble. Enjoy bubble. It's a bubble. Easy yeah. for you to say. Yeah. What did you notice when you when you would change as a competitor? Because I, I like asking this question because when you're competing uh, at that level, you're you're measuring your water intake. Yeah. You're measuring your Food intake by the to the gram. You're you know you're measuring your sleep and your you know so you could probably tell just changing one thing you'd know okay this is what's happening to me. What would well, you see? It it was one of those things that was very obvious to me how much of a, a, a impact that it would make. You know, very similar to the first time that light bulb went off for me for like rep ranges, like you said. I mean, I remember being a young kid and reading in a magazine that. You know, if you wanted to build muscle and build strength, that you wanted to be in that four to six rep range. Mm -hmm. And for years, I didn't leave that because I was a skinny kid with no muscle. So yeah. why the fuck would I ever want to train like yeah. a endurance athlete or somebody who's in the high like high rep range? I didn't want that. I wanted muscle. So I stayed in that forever until, and I can't remember if it was a trainer or another study or article that I had written or read, and. I go, oh shit, well maybe I should apply, maybe I should try this 15, and I literally, it was years, years of not training in, in a higher than six reps, like it was like blasphemy to go above that, like if I did seven reps, yeah, I want mass, yeah, it was, it, it was more towards four reps, you know what I'm yeah. saying, and then every once in a while I might be able to get six out, so when I went to 15, and I'm lifting way lighter weight, everything's way lighter uh, weight than what I was doing before, I, my body blew up. Like I, it was one of those pivotal moments in my journey that I, I saw this huge change after training. For, and that was like, holy shit. And so it was very similar to that. The first time that I really applied the timing, because what happens years and years of lifting. And if you're never, and you never really, really track rest periods, 100% you gravitate to a certain rest period uh, to, for certain exercises for everything and so oh yeah everybody likes what they're good at yeah so i and i knew this going into other th variables that i had had manipulated and i knew better and so i understood the science and i knew the importance of it what a great time i'm a competitor and i'm training and everything is in line so you know what's what is great about that like you said sal is that you can really tell you know yeah, you drink a little bit more water oh i see this or you yeah, do a little bit of that. yeah yeah you do one little change one little thing and you can tell and it, it is it's one of those it's a game changer if you've never manipulated it no. especially when you go to the opposite end of the spectrum like if somebody decides to track their rest periods and they find out that they're resting like 90 seconds and they drop it down to like 60 seconds or they increase it by 20 or 30 seconds will make a difference but not a game changing difference but if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum it'll be like a it's like a different workout like you've never oh worked my God, it's so different yeah if you're the circuit girl Going to like a strength phase with three minute rest periods will completely change your body. Mm -hmm. hey, don't change anything else. Do, yeah, <laughs> this, I know that's totally sexist, but I mean it's a, it it it's like goes to the point we were talking about earlier that there's just been, more of them than yeah they've been, no, been yeah, yeah they've been marketed to that way for a very long time. And those are the clients that they're circuit guys. I typically would gravitate towards the three minute rest periods, and then my meathead dudes that love to put you know three, four plates on the bench press and make sure that every girl in the gym sees that it's on there before they actually lift it. And, and they rest. they'd sit there and eat a sandwich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They lift, <laughs> every, and they go to the bathroom. They go Read fill a the, newspaper. They fill their water or, jug up. They ask three people to spot them. You know, they get five-minute rest periods. Yeah. Put that fucker on a little circuit 30-second rest periods and watch his body uh, change. Dude, so. you think, you, you, Justin, you just reminded me there was back, way back in the day when I was younger working out, there was this fucking, just this big but also overweight older power lifter looking dude yeah. in the gym and he used to fucking literally do that he would sit on the bench <laughs> yep. in between sets and read the newspaper yeah did, yeah. did, did you I see that? I just think we remembered this guy that, yeah, he, he, he would, he'd be like uh, where the leg press machine was and, and he would just be there all day. And I was like waiting to, to get in. I'm like, <laughs> can I get in? And he would just, he's reading his newspaper. He's like, just, just chilling, dude. It's so, it's so funny, Adam. You're talking about how you got stuck in rep ranges and stuff as a kid. I was, uh, I, I was writing one of uh, one of our blogs the other day, and I, I started to write about. 
the first bodybuilding magazine that I bought. And um, it's so funny how certain things you'll just pop in your mind. This tends to happen with me. And I remember like, oh, it was 1993 Flex Magazine. Mike Matarazzo was on the cover. So I went on eBay and I found the exact uh, magazine, the same one. And it was Mike Matarazzo on the cover. And the reason why I, this was so impactful to me, besides being one of my first bodybuilding magazines, was in it. First of all, Mike Matarazzo, Italian guy, so I identified with him. Jack, he had these really big arms, just really muscular guy. He's now deceased. But in there, there was a, a article that was mass gaining principles. Like, these are the principles for mass gaining. And one of them was low rep. Like, you have to lift in the low rep range. You yeah, have to rest yeah. a long time. You have to. Forever. And and then there were cutting principles. Which ones do you think I followed to the T? Which yeah. ones do you think I avoided like fucking crazy? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, those are for cutting. That's, e- no. that's exactly I'm never how, doing that that's shit. That's exactly how I looked <laughs> at it. Like, yeah. in my eyes as a young kid lifting, you know, I thought that if you wanted to lose weight or get lean, which I never had a pro- I could see my ribs. I was so lean. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. I didn't need to get any leaner, so I didn't want anything to do with- Is that a 10-pack? No, it was my ribs. Yeah, <laughs> no. I didn't want nothing to do with 10, 12, 15 reps. That's just going to make me skinnier. Yeah. I was scared to death of those reps. It's so dude. funny because I did that for so long, and then I read an article by a, another bodybuilder. I want to say his name was Francis Hillebrand. I think I'm saying his name right. He wrote an article about how he got his body to look amazing by doing 15 to 20 reps and how he's like, no, I do 15 to 20 reps. I get a good pump and it builds a lot of muscle. And so because I like the look of his physique, I did it and then my body responded and then I got stuck on that for a second. And it's just funny how we we tend to do that. You know, This is one of the things that I I really love about Stan Efforting um, because he's like a a huge – advocate for 20 rep ranges well now mm. yeah yep. and so and i think it's such a great message for his community of people that are probably following him i mean you if you're following stan and you're a big fan of stan most of these are big burly guys or people that want to be big and burly and strong the guy squats you know 600 pounds for like 20 fucking reps he's insane you know like what he does is crazy but I think that a lot of people that probably follow him are i think the avatar is similar to me when I was 20, you know, I, I would see a Stan and be like, yeah, man, I want to look like that. And he's like the Hulk. And to hear him promote 20 rep range, I think is such a great. That's what Flex did to him, right? Yeah. He started yeah. training with Flex Wheeler and Flex is like, yeah, you've been training like this for a long time. Let's have you let's slow down. This. Yeah, let's have you like do 20 rep, you know, squats and leg presses and let's have you slow down and squeeze the muscle because he trained like a like a power lifter for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Strong as hell. And he gained hella muscle, you know, yeah. and he's like, oh, shit, it works. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just it. It's I, I would say it's the most overlooked and easiest variable to manipulate. And so if you're listening to this podcast and you're a little confused as to what you need to change with your workouts, because there's so many different things and you've been working out for a while and I don't know what exercises to do and all that stuff, just change the rest period. Literally, just change the rest period. Give yourself a couple weeks and watch how awesome your body responds. Right. Right. Um, you can also go to mindpumpfree.com and download any one of our free guides. We have a lot of them on there. Some of them teach you how to squat more weight, develop your midsection, uh, build your arms, your calves. There's uh, quite a few of them there. They're all free. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us on our individual Instagram pages. So if you want to check out and see what we're into, what we're doing, we provide different information on these pages. You can find my page on Instagram. It's Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. And Justin, everyone's favorite, is Mind Pump Justin. I love you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>